Hi, my name is Mary Lou and I teach at Weston High School. And I'm David Welty and I teach at Fairhaven High School. And we're here today to talk to you about how do we sort things. Now when I say sort, you might think of this, right? Sorting your laundry, sorting the dark clothes from the light clothes from the bright clothes. So when we look at a cell, okay, a cell is composed of all types of different macromolecules. We got uh, uh, proteins and DNA and sugars. And what we need to do is pull the proteins out from this big mixture of stuff. So we're not talking about laundry. We're talking about really, really small things. Now, you may have heard of some ways to sort things, like paper chromatography. Now, we have a little example right here of uh, some alcohol as our solvent, paper, and then just black ink as our material that we're sorting. So this is a demo of this. And then after a little while, take some time, you end up with something like this. So you can see here, we have our black line, our ink that started off, that's separated into two bands, the purple and the blue. Another way to sort things is through gel electrophoresis. Now, here's a gel that I made, right? It doesn't look like much, it's jello-y, right? But if you zoomed in on the gel, it would look a lot like this sponge. Right, it has all these tiny little holes on the inside. It's a meshwork of agarose. And the uh, agarose forms holes that molecules can travel through, depending on the charge of those molecules. Another way to look at it is imagine that you are a freshman student on this side of the hallway, and you need to get through here to the other. You're going to need to squirrel and snake your way through to you can get to the other side. And that's kind of what these molecules have to do to go from one side to the other. And our molecules, like for example this purple dye, can be sometimes a mixture of molecules, not just one. It looks like purple to us, but it might be a mixture of pink and blue. So if we wanted to use our gel to separate them, we'd put them all in, the gel at the top in these wells. We would turn on some electricity, and the dyes, not only are they different sizes and shapes, but they also have charge, so they'll move towards this positive end of the gel, and they'll start moving out of those wells. But as they move, they might not move at the same rate. So the blue ones, the really small ones in this picture, move really fast, so they move farther through the gel. And the pink ones here don't move as fast. They're a little slower. They get caught up in this mesh, so they're back here close to the uh, wells. The yellow here, you can see, is somewhere in the middle. right? It's not quite as small as the blue, but it's not as big as the red. Now, Mary, you have a really ingenious way that you captured what happens in this process by putting a cell phone underneath a gel electrophoresis unit. Let's take a look in real life at our gel. So here I'm doing the same thing. I've loaded some dyes into this gel. Oh, you can see the electricity's on. They're moving towards this positive end, and they're starting to separate. Right? You can start to see the yellows are pulling ahead. They're moving a little bit faster than some of the blues. The blues are getting caught up in this meshwork and getting left behind close to the wells. Now, the things we want to sort aren't dyes necessarily. In this case, we actually have a whole bunch of cells making a protein for us. Now, this is a picture of a bacteria cell, and our bacteria cell has some stuff inside, right? There's DNA, the bacteria's own DNA. There's plasmids we've inserted that have genes that we want. Um, to produce particular proteins like our RFP, or our red fluorescent protein. And you can see there's a whole bunch of different proteins. So it's making the protein we want, the red one, but it's also making other stuff. And what I have here is a 3D printed model of a protein. And you can kind of see the complexity of the structure. And what we want to do is we want to separate all the other proteins out till we get our red fluorescent protein. Now, if you think back and remember about proteins, they're made up of these amino acids, and amino acids have characteristic shapes and structures. So they have this um, amino group, the NH, and then they have this acid group, or carboxylic acid, and then they have an R group, and that's the variable part of our amino acid. Some of those R groups are hydrophobic, right, so they don't like water. Some of those R groups are hydrophilic, so they do like water. And there are some that are, have charge, like positive or negative charge. But these characteristics of the amino acids and correspondingly um, help fold our protein or determine the shape and structure of our protein and therefore affect its function. And what we're going to do, and here's another model of a hydrophobic group on a protein, and in this case the hydrophobic um, side chains are inside the protein, away from the aqueous environment of the cell, and we're going to manipulate the, this environment so that we can purify this red fluorescent protein. 
The first step, though, is we have to bust our proteins out of our cell, right? We have to break open that cell membrane or lyse the cell, and all the cell membrane and other junk is down here in the pellet, where our proteins and all the good stuff is here in the supernatant. So we need to sort out this mixture. And the way we're going to do that is by using column chromatography. So here's an example of our column, right? And you can see here, this white stuff, right, isn't just powder. It turns out it's a bunch of tiny little beads. And each of those beads has a phenyl group that makes it very hydrophobic. So they call this a hydrophobic interaction column because the properties of those beads are very hydrophobic. Now, it turns out that's great for us because our protein is also very hydrophobic, right? And the hydrophobic parts were where again? They're in the inside of the protein, tucked away from the aqueous environment. And what we got to do is we got to pop those out of the inside so they're on the outside. So we're going to use a bunch of different solutions, three different solutions, in fact. And we're going to use salt to help us out. So we have a high salt solution. Here's our high salt. Yep. We have a low salt solution. And we have a no salt solution. So these different concentrations of salt are going to help us sort our protein. The first step is that high salt. So in the high salt, okay, we have this red fluorescent protein, and this is going to change the conformation of the protein such that those hydrophobic groups pop out, and we can now have them interact with that hydrophobic resin of the column. So as you can see in our column, we've added our mixture to the top. You can see that the red is stuck here at the very, very top. It's interacting with those beads. It's sticking to the hydrophobic beads because it's hydrophobic too. So the stuff that's coming out the bottom will actually be really hydrophilic. So this is a way, using high salt, to get rid of hydrophilic proteins from our mix. So in step two, we're going to go to a low salt. We're still going to have the hydrophobic parts of the red fluorescent protein out, and we're also going to have some other hydrophobic proteins, but they're not as strongly hydrophobic. And those are going to slowly flow through the column until they pass through. So here you can see our red fluorescent protein is somewhere in the middle after we've added this low salt mixture. So it started to move through the column. It hasn't completely let go. Right? It's still kind of interacting with the column. But things that aren't as hydrophobic, that don't have as many hydrophobic groups, are falling out the bottom. Remember, our red fluorescent protein is very hydrophobic. So it's going to move through the column very slowly. It's interacting with the column. And then for the last step, okay, we're going to go with no salt. And in no salt, okay, the protein is going to change its shape. So now that the hydrophobic regions are inside the protein, they're not exposed to the aqueous environment, and this is not going to allow it to um, interact with the resin of the column, and it's going to flow through, and we'll be able to collect it. So they call this no salt buffer an eluding buffer because it's actually going to let go of the column and come out or elute. So now you can see in the bottom in our collection tube, we actually have some RFP. It turns out this is one way to get a really concentrated solution of only RFP. This is one way to purify the protein. So one of the questions you might have is, why do we do this? Well, we're moving into an age where we can actually turn proteins into medicine. For instance, insulin. You may have friends who, um, who have uh, diabetes or parents or guardians, and this is a medicine that we can produce by making uh, a protein, and it's really helping people have uh, healthier lives. So the same process, the bacteria making the protein for us, us busting open the cells, putting that mixture into a column, and then separating out the different kinds of protein until we get the protein that we want based on the interaction with the column and the different solutions. So we hope that this helps you understand the, the protein purification side of molecular biology. We spend a lot of time talking about cloning genes and, and the DNA, but we sometimes forget about the protein, which is what we're really after. And one of the reasons we take chemistry is so we can understand how proteins work. Thanks. Thank you.